Let's firstly open on a simple interpretation on how to do an exorcism on that parasite of lust in your particular life. A simple trick to get rid of that demon. As most of us have mentioned, this society has been designed in such a way that we are heavily influenced to stay in the lower realm of consciousness. Now I'm going to make the point a little bit later on in this video, but I don't believe, this is maybe an out of pocket thing to say, that the idea of lust, let's say the act of it in the forms of promiscuity, let's say promiscuity, let's say the other P word, the other two P words, one in which you sell yourself and the other in which you sell maybe your soul. Those things in and of themselves are not so much the issue. The issue is the vibrational state it puts you in. I have many people who ask me the question, Joseph, I know individuals in my life, right? And they are such degenerates. They drink and they smoke and they do all the wrong things, but it doesn't seem like they are affected on any kind of level. In fact, they seem to just get in this flow state whereby things just continually come their way. Why is this happening? And why am I struggling when I'm trying to reduce my karmic debt in terms of trying to remove this demon of lust in my life and trying to reconnect to my higher self, to God, to energy, to divinity, right? And the answer is you are only perceiving with your sense organs, right? You cannot intuit what that person is experiencing. And those particular individuals are you look in their eyes and there's no lights behind them. You can give them these trappings of success, the cars, the clothes, the chains, the, the, um, the sexual partners, right? But it has no movement internally on their heart. And th there's a beautiful quote in the, well, I wouldn't say it's a beautiful quote, but it's a very interesting and uh, moving quote in the Quran that says, Allah has sealed their hearts. Allah has sealed their hearts. And the point I'm trying to make with this is what you perceive with your sense organs, with the materialistic surface level information that you're getting from what you see is rarely consistent or accurate with what that individual is experiencing. And those individuals, I promise you, are in an emotional hell, not even in an emotional hell. They are in a state of paralysis, of deadness. There is no feeling there. Their hearts have been sealed by God. and. That is their particular karma for their life. Trust me, trust me. There's a there's a um, paradigm shift that happens in your consciousness whereby you, you, you get a sense of familiarity with expectations of good and bad things in your life. And when you have things going your way in excess, you begin to lose sensitivity and gratitude towards those things. But perhaps this is a conversation for another time. Let's continue. Hypersexuality is attacking us from all angles. Some of us, including myself, can only retain our seed for so long until we finally give in. The most important thing is that each time we get back on track with our SR, it lasts longer than our previous attempts. I enjoy the sentiment behind that particular premise. I think that the effort, I'm going to quote another piece of scripture here um, from uh, Hinduism now. And when Krishna is speaking to Arjuna, the protagonist, or another way you can, you can phrase it is, when God is speaking to us, there is a passage in the Gita which refers to this idea that you reduce your karmic debt with intention. Not as much, not, not just in the physical act of, let's say, relinquishing this demon of uh, lust in our life, but as soon as an individual intends to open their heart and close it from lust and move towards light, to remember their deity, then their karmic debt is being reduced. A weight is being lifted off their soul. And we can take great credit and solace in that idea that it's an intention, by the way, and you can't fake an intention because I can hear the comments going, oh, Joseph, I can intend to do. No, I mean, intend with your heart. When you, are, when you come from a place of sincerity to reduce your karmic debt, to reduce and exercise this demon of lust, from your soul, there is a reduction in your karmic debt. And you know, that's, that's the word of God. The main thing we all need to understand is that this pent up energy needs to be transferred through exercise, creativity and meditation. This is sexual transmutation in its essence. We have to 
design a strict daily routine for ourselves and stick to it no matter what. One of the main causes for relapses with my clients is there's so much time in their day where they are bored. And what happens when you're bored is you revert back to a autopilot state of consciousness, a very, um, a very low vibrational level. And if you are vibrating at that level, you will typically follow your survival instincts, which are either to eat, so individuals you know, watching TV, eating and gaining weight, or have sex. And those individuals who are typically in apathy will not be able to have sex because they're not attractive to other partners. So they find a way of tricking their body into thinking that they're actually reproducing by experiencing virtual intercourse, which is an evil trick you play on the mind, the soul, and the spirit. So this individual is correct. Make sure that you are leveraging the asset of time in your life in order to mitigate this very lower carnal, uh, very animalistic state of mind, very limbic system level, very reactive, very impulsive. There's no higher executive function going on in those moments. And life is so interesting. There are so many different hobbies you can pick up. There's so much stuff to do that is more creative. This shouldn't hopefully be an issue. And I'd love to hear some of your examples down in the comment section below uh, how you keep higher executive function online and mitigate the presence of lust in your life. If we don't direct this energy systematically with a procedure, then it will turn into a irritability and anger and especially into its usual path, as I said, lust. But once we ground, we ground ourselves we can truly access the higher realms of reality. A beautiful book is called The Path of the Initiate by Rudolf Steiner. And Rudolf Steiner was an occultist. He was one of these individuals that entered into full possession of his mind, body, and soul. I'm talking complete and utter jurisdiction, complete control. There is no higher God than his God and his consciousness. He's not driven and molded and funneled into certain paths that are dictated by carnality and impulsivity. And one of the ways, the only ways he mentioned that you can start to enter into full possession of your mind, body, and your soul is by disciplining the carnal reflex, the sexual impulse. And you can only access the spiritual levels until you transmute the lower energies from the first three chakras into the heart plexus, which is the changing point from survival to higher God consciousness to you know, higher self consciousness. And that passage, that bridge that one must cross in order to access those transcendence, um, transcendent states, pardon me, is by moving out of limbic system and into prefrontal cortex uh, possession. So from feminine mind to masculine mind, and I don't mean feminine in a pejorative sense, I mean feminine in a reality sense. Feminine is the chaos, it's the beauty, sex is beautiful, it is chaotic. Without it, life wouldn't be worth living. But at the same time, a life that is too in excess of chaos in insects is a an uncontrollable one, uh, a world without order, a world in which you're actually seeing right now we're living in a state of the feminine and not into the masculine. But there is a shift coming in the next uh, two to three decades, maybe in the next century, where we're going to enter back into possession of order and the masculine into disciplining this lower nature and entering into full possession of our mind, our bodies and souls. We're working with this energy, not against it. I really need to highlight that. The only way to completely defeat lust is by staying organized physically and mentally by sticking to your routine. This routine needs to also be aligned towards your goal. He who has a why can withstand any how. And that's Friedrich Nietzsche. Most people who fail continually, repeatedly on this particular journey of exercising, performing that exorcism on that demon of lust is because they have no reason to. They have no greater reason to. They say, Joseph, why? What's the point? There is no higher purpose for me to follow. And those individuals will continue spiraling down into an emotional hell, which I'll share with you in just a moment, actually. I'll share you a, a mental uh, and emotional and a physical example of what hell actually looks like. And those individuals who are seeking to escape from that realm will only do so if there is a reason for it. If you have a why, the how fixes itself. So let me ask you, what is your why? 
what is it your why is it to retire your family is it to stand on your own two feet and move out of your parents house is it to finally actualize the higher self and realize the god within you is it to find friends is it to find a lover is it to start a family i think those are all very compelling reasons why but now you need to add the detail now you need to add the nuance now you need to add the bells and whistles that create a relationship a personal relationship with that outcome because saying you want to be a millionaire has no it, it doesn't resonate with the heart it resonates with the mind but it doesn't resonate with your heart you need to find a goal that resonates with your heart what are you going to use that million dollars million pounds for what is the greater purpose material possessions in my opinion don't create an emotional connection don't have an affinity with the heart strong enough in order for you to execute at the level that you need to so find something that resonates with the heart that oscillates with the feeling of love and i know that might sound disney but it's very very true and you will continue to fail unless you recognize the wants and desires and the, the love fundamentally and desire is a precursor to that of of the heart you have to ask yourself what are my values yeah like i said what kind of man do i want to be what do i fear the most that could be another very compelling reason that you articulate your goal around what about loss what about if i don't get rid of this habit i might lose my family i might lose my home i might lose my possessions and fear as much as i don't like entertaining it is more compelling than the idea of gain the fear of loss is a survival mechanism and people are more sensitive and will act with more ruthlessness on this idea that they may lose something what do i fear the most is it real or made up in my mind you have to really dig deep down to the root of what you want from this life and create a step-by-step -step action plan break it down into days hours and minutes I do a lot of onboarding calls, well not onboarding calls, discovery calls with potential clients and one of the initial assignments I get them to do to let me know if this person is worth working with, and I know that sounds harsh but I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain what I mean in a moment, is I want you to create a why. I want you to create this, a step-by-step -step action plan on what you want. And I always say to them in our, in our, in our discovery calls from the first meeting is, if I have to motivate you, think about this. If I have to motivate you, if I have to encourage you, if I have to persuade you to make a plan for your life and you can't do that, that is really worrying. That is really, really concerning. That is, you have bigger problems than I can help. And you need to figure that out on your own. And if they can complete that assignment, then I know this individual is self-invested into bettering their life. If they can't, I can't help you. I can't save everybody. I don't, I don't pretend to try to. I don't pretend to try to. But the point I like to make when I'm coaching and um, you know, developing a relationship with people that I fundamentally want to do well with, uh, you know, personally, um, professionally, uh, spiritually, is... I can't do 100% of the work for you. I can meet you halfway there. If you're hanging off a side of a cliff, I can hold out my hand to you. I can hold out my hand and say, grab my hand, brother. But if you can't make the effort to reach 50% of the way and take my hand, you're gonna fall. You're going to fall. But I'm there 50% of the way. The other 50%, that's up to you. That's up to you. Break it down into days, hours, and minutes. This is about reverse engineering your outcomes. When we get desirous, we are just fantasizing about a sexual act. We are going to have a woman. Thinking about sex takes us out of the present moment. We begin to feel a sensation that is mixed between our past experiences and the future ones that haven't happened yet. A great tool that I have been using in my own awareness and self-talk. Let's say I start lusting over a woman, I begin to get that sexual allure. Basically, I become aware of that emotion. I use this awareness in the moment to say something in my mind. I repeat the same logical words over and over. She's just a person, women are just people. She is uh, not the sex, she is a human being. She is somebody's daughter, a sister, a mother, a grandmother. I say maybe not the grandmother, well I don't know, I shouldn't. 
I shouldn't judge, I shouldn't yuck your yum, should I? I keep saying this in my mind until my body no longer feels tense. Yeah, mental mantras or asanas or posture, think about that, an asana is a, or a mantra, part of me, is an asana for the mind. That just means a posture for the mind. And you can keep your mind in very potent and powerful postures with specific mantras. One of my favorite ones is let it be, let it go. Inhale, let it be. Exhale, let it go. Or inhale, I am not this body. I am not even this mind. I am not this body. Exhale, I'm not even this mind. And in this way, you come into realization that you are not this body. You are not this mind. You are not lost. You are not desire. You are the observer. You are the witness. You are the experiencer of lust, of desire. You are not the desire. That is an identification. That is an act of fate. That is an act of predetermining your destiny. And I don't like to entertain for a moment that my destiny is in any other, any other person's hands but my own. But when you identify with something, you rob yourself of that control. You rob yourself of that power. And I'm telling you with these techniques, you can enter into your power. You are not this body, you are not even this mind. Let the emotion be there. Lust is not bad in and of itself. It is a natural part of being a human being. But to, be, to become lost, that is, that is cheap. That is cheap of the reality of what you are and the reality of what you are is the immutable soul, the immortal soul, the unyielding soul. That is the truth. The truth that you are desire, that is a false. That is a lie. Then I make sure I work out or do something that mentally is mentally strenuous before I go to bed that night so that energy finds a more useful outlet than a wet dream or creating more lust later. Yeah, the common, let's say, problem around wet dreams because I get issues or questions, pardon me, on this is the mind, the subconscious mind typically accepts what the conscious mind has been in before it slips into that state. And that is when you move from beta brainwave to alpha to theta to delta. So from high frequency to low frequency. And in that low frequency, the most important thing is that you prime yourself to, for sleep, which is why I encourage meditation before bed, visualization before bed, journaling before bed, and those journalings, those meditations, even reading of scripture, even reading of the Gita, even reading of the Quran, even reading of the Holy Bible, the Tao Te Ching, the Torah, whatever it is, puts you in such a high state that is north of courage, that doesn't even come close to lust, that these things will not befall you. There are some physical components of it for sure, but this is the main sentiment from which it proceeds. Now I have a step-by-step -step process here that is gonna be very, very valuable for you in order to start to exercise this demon of lust. The first and foremost is to understand what lust is, and lust is a state of wanting, craving, and fundamentally not having. Why is this so dangerous? This is so dangerous because, again, it's unbecoming of the reality of what you are, the immortal, immutable soul. And also, if you identify with a state of lust, of not having, of wanting, what does that affirm to the world around you? What does that affirm to God? What does that affirm to nature? What does that affirm to consciousness? It affirms a state of lack, a state of incompleteness. And the world only reflects that of what you already are. If you affirm a internal and identify with a state of being incomplete, then that is what you will see in the environment around you. So it's dangerous to identify with it. And I've talked about this again, mirror principle, as above, so below, so within, so without, so within. If you hold lust inside you, you will see that state of not wanting outside of you. Lust is never satisfied in this way. I love this quote by Paramahansa Yogananda, ever fed, never satisfied. This is the beautiful Yogananda, ever fed, never satisfied, never fed, ever satisfied, never fed, never fed. That's why fasting um, and practices, you know, I, I believe this act of chastity is in a similar way a fast from the indulgence of the sex organs, let's say. Nature is reflective in this way. You don't get what you want, you get what you already are. That's the key point. I'm gonna share with you the emotional hell in just a moment, but first, coming back to this uh, mental model that we need to be commensurate with in order to understanding it, because how can you expect to execute on what I tell you if you do not 
if you do not believe it has any utility. Lust is an objective emotion. We all experience lust. It only gets dangerous when we identify with the emotion, when we become the energy of wanting and craving and not having. We have established this. How then do we avoid this? Creating a stronger relationship with the observer and more distance between the energy of longing. And this is very similar to what this individual is sharing in this post here. It's to identify with the witness, with the individual that is observing the emotion and not the emotion in and of itself. So several mental models, I think some of which we've established already, lust in and of itself is not wrong, only our lack of control and identification with it. Lust is the cheap form of love, which is what you are truly seeking. Love is satiation, contentment and gratitude for the now. And lust is a craving, a wanting, is a greedy child who wants to constantly eat sweets and rot their teeth. You don't need to wait for fullness, you're full now never fed, ever satisfied. Practical models in order to start to take this demon out. Remove opportunities where you're interfacing with lust, where your, your, your psyche is beginning and your, and your consciousness is warping. And that is going to have to be these very scary crystal balls, these palantirs, these screens. The screen in which you're viewing me through now is a uh, you know, is a, is a dark or can be used for dark magic, is a, is a dark, occult, dangerous item. And you need to be very, very careful about what you allow to, you know, here's another way to put it, a really scary way to put it, a more uh, interesting and unique way of putting it. Your eyes are an external part of your brain. Your eyes are an external part of your brain. And you're not just looking at something, you're putting it into your brain. You're putting it into your consciousness. It is going through the flesh and straight into the seat of the soul. In the third eye, that's where your soul sits. Write down a feasible and measurable goal and reverse engineer. Exercise an outlet for nervous energy, movement, music, or art. Silence the automatic nervous system with the breath. Breath controls thoughts, controls words, controls feelings, controls actions, controls habits, controls character, controls destiny. What is the answer to controlling your destiny? <sighs> controlling your breath. This is very, very powerful. And as I promised, this particular chart should be up on your wall at home. You should know this inside and out. Here below, hopefully you, my, uh, my cursor is showing up. This is where the consciousness of humankind is right now consciousness of desire, of craving, disappointing, denying, and look at this, a process of enslavement. Where do you need to be to start to transcend this? Well, you need to be north of courage, which is oscillating around 200. Pride, also dangerous. Look at all the, this is hell. South of courage, this is hell. I know people who live here. I lived here one time. Once you become north, and you do things and put things in your environment that oscillate at this level. When you read scripture, scripture is some of the highest oscillating uh, vibrational books. I think, I believe it oscillates around uh, peace and enlightenment, things like the Holy Bible, things like the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads. E even the act of reading them instantly jumps you up from these states. Meditation can jump you up from these states. Prayer can jump you up from these states. What's interesting is to note the sidebars to pride, um, sorry, to desire, anger. Get angry at your situation because it's an easier transition. That's why a lot of individuals here, you hear a, a very uh, maybe Neolithic or caveman style of transmutation is to just do a hundred press ups because it, it gets you angry, gets you in pride. And it's an easy jump from that into, into courage and then neutrality, willingness, acceptance, reason, and love. All of these things are an act of climbing out of hell exercising that parasite of lust on your soul and fundamentally entering into full possession of your higher self. These are not theories, these are facts. Speak soon.